First at Five. From the University of Florida's College of Journalism and Communications, you're watching WUFT News. Welcome to WUFT News First at Five. I'm Ophelia Jacobson. And I'm Sarah Sowers. Thanks for joining us. A historic home is set to move across Gainesville on Sunday for a chance to preserve its culture and history. WUFT's Camila Pereira joins us in the studio after paying a visit to the neighborhood today. Camila, what was the home like? Well, Sarah, right now it's looking a bit bare as the home is roofless and in preparation for its big move this weekend, making a 2.2 mile trip Sunday morning to its new destination. We're carrying this house away from the increasing gentrification that's happening in the Fifth Avenue neighborhood, but hopefully the city of Gainesville will decide to save this neighborhood and protect the cultural heritage that is being lost. At 100 years old, <laughs> this home is taking a trip across Gainesville in an effort to provide affordable housing. I visited the home with Tyler Smith. He's in charge of this project. Yeah, it's this street right here. And it's what like, were the reasons to kind of move the house? I think you told me a little bit about that. But you yeah. So I was just worried about, you know, a home getting demolished when the city of Gainesville has a lack of affordable housing in general. Nine months ago, the city wanted to destroy the home. Smith heard and did everything he could to save it, 48 hours before it was demolished. It's been a lot of paperwork, of course, and that's really what we've been uh, dealing with is just how can we like move this house across the city of Gainesville. And after getting permits approved from the city, the home is ready to make its trip across town from Fifth Avenue and Pleasant Street to North Lincoln and Duval Heights. The same journey activist Cora Peterson Robertson took when she attended the A. Quinn Jones's old Lincoln School. And lo and behold, this is the home right here. The home. And the roof has been disassembled. Yeah. That's why it kind of looks a little bald right now, <laughs> but. <laughs> but it's in the works of being moved. It is, and it needs to fit underneath the street lights and power lines. Yeah. That's why the roof was disassembled. It's history in the making. This is like kind of sustainability to the max, I guess you could say. <laughs> and he hopes it inspires more preservation in the city. And Smith tells me he hopes to have the home ready for a family to rent within the next six months, while the city of Gainesville is working to build a new home in the original location. Thanks, Camila. Well, it was a beautiful day today, Sarah. I'm loving all this sunshine. Me too, and I hope it continues this weekend for Earth Day. Let's ask WUFT's Jensen Young. Thanks, Ophelia. Thanks, Sarah. Currently tracking a storm pushing in towards the panhandle right now, but it shouldn't be hitting us in the Gainesville area until tomorrow afternoon. Looking at some temperatures right now, a lot of the west of the state looking in, in the mid 80s right now as we look towards the east side of the state, dipping into the 70s. Looking at the campus cam right now, some beautiful blue skies, a little bit of clouds in the area, not too much wind, beautiful right now. Looking at our hour by hour again, mid 80s at the moment, dipping into the 70s and down into the 60s at night. Back to you. Thank you, Jensen. A beloved tree in downtown Gainesville will be saved after much debate. The Gainesville City Commission decided yesterday that the big oak tree just north of Harry's Restaurant can stay. Instead of removing the tree, the sidewalk will be expanded on the entire block where the roots of several trees are disrupting pavers. The new project may cost tens of thousands of dollars, but the city intends to use the money from its tree mitigation fund. Angled parking in front of the businesses on the block of Southeast First Avenue will become parallel spaces, resulting in the loss of six spots. Well, the Heritage Foundation picked Florida Governor Ron DeSantis to deliver the final speech for its 50th anniversary leadership summit. Today, DeSantis told the conservative group that he's not afraid to challenge the liberal status quo, such as with the education law that critics call Don't Say Gay. Now, my view is we got to go on offense. Uh, we need to be leaning into issues. We need to be raising issues when other people aren't willing to do it. And we are not going to worry about what the left and the media say about us. We are going to do what is right. Last fall, the Heritage Foundation unveiled an Education Freedom Report Card. Florida and Arizona led the rankings with New Jersey, New York, and D.C. at the bottom. 
The prospect of a governor-appointed board taking over management of GRU will loom over a special meeting tonight between city commissioners and the current utility advisory board. A bill to take control away from the city, pitched as a better way to address fairness, budget, and, de and debt issues, passed a key House committee this week. Representative Yvonne Hinson, the only member of the local delegation to oppose the bill, offered amendments which were quickly shot down. Those who traveled to speak complained later that the committee was rushing through the GRU bill, only granting 30 seconds per speaker. Gainesville Mayor Harvey Ward used his brief time to mention the city's latest work to cut its budget dependency on GRU profits. We have uh, instituted a formula for our utility transfer. Mayor, thank, thank we have so cut it by Peter Damaris, you're recognized, followed by, by more than half. Collins. And uh, I would love to talk with the individual members of the committee as this moves forward. And I would love for some of you all to join us this Friday evening as we Sir, have you a hearing time. in Gainesville. Representative Chuck Clemens defended his bill, saying GRU has racked up four times the debt of its peers. Clemens said that over the last 10 years, the city has taken out more money for other uses, 100 million more than GRU net earnings. Well, if you're looking for something to do, Gainesville residents have the opportunity to immerse themselves in Latin culture this weekend. That's right. The Hispanic Gator Film Festival will, will kick off this Saturday. WUFT's Tyler Carmona was able to speak to the event's founder and some participants today. How'd that go, Tyler? That's right, I did. Thanks, Sarah. I was able to speak to some of these filmmakers and I gained some valuable insight on this upcoming festival. Although the main event is Saturday, they've been holding screenings and press events all week. The Hispanic Gator Film Festival will take place inside the Rights Union at the Orange and Blue Auditorium. Gator students will have the opportunity to showcase their skills as visual artists and their passion for filmmaking. I interpret filmmaking as a form of service by being able to put a camera in front of someone and give them a yeah. microphone. It gives them that time and that platform to really share what's important to them and um, allows us to be connected. Sophia Abulfathi is a UF student who will be participating in this year's festival. The festival was founded last year by Louis Laguerre, a UF student. Last year's festival featured more than 10 original pieces from UF students and alumni. Obviously one of the things that we want to accomplish with the festival is provide a platform for Hispanic stories and for Hispanic creators to be showcased at the university. The festival has two different sections, films from Hispanic creators and films from Hispanic stories. They're welcoming a wide variety of films including animations and documentaries. So it's a movie about being young, like being yourself, like sometimes stupid things have good outcomes, so just like take risks. So it's about her work, uh, working with children at the youth ranch and her journey moving from Puerto Rico and starting uh, the uni program she does. This year's event is expected to feature about 15 pieces. It'll start off at 1.30 p.m. Now the event kicks off at 1.30, but it's not just open to Gator students, anybody is welcome. Thanks, Tyler. Well, the Supreme Court is expected to make a decision today that could cause a major change over abortion rights. We'll tell you more on the upcoming decision when we return to First at Five. You're watching WUFT-TV News. Welcome back. The Supreme Court could decide today what happens with short, short term with access to a common abortion pill. A series of lower court decisions are in conflict over what should happen while key cases go forward on appeal. NBC's Drew Patrimo reports from Washington on the politics of the abortion debate. After the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade last summer, medication abortion remained an option nationwide, even as some states restricted abortion access. But the court's expected decision today could cause major change. So when we see what is happening in different places in our country, which is really about rolling back progress. The court is considering restrictions to the use of mifepristone, a key drug in medication abortion, including stopping the drug from being shipped through the mail and how many weeks into pregnancy it can be used. This is about the Republicans' ongoing quest to criminalize abortion care in this country. Democrats are taking aim at Republicans over the issue, and while some in the GOP appear unfazed... Am I worried about the politics of it? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Others voice concern that the party's stance on abortion is hurting them with voters. Many pro-life people still don't want the heavy hand of government making that decision for women and girls. We will not win the popular vote in 24 if we continue down this path of extremism. No matter what the Supreme Court decides, Red state, blue state, we, we can hide. hide. The war on abortion is nationwide. The
battle over medication abortion is likely to continue in the courts and in politics. Drew Petromo, NBC News, Washington. A terrifying scene in Tampa Friday after two huge power poles crashed through a semi-truck on I-275. The driver, who is okay tonight, told the Florida Highway Patrol he thought the vehicle veered into his lane and cut him off. The 33-year-old driver says he slammed on the brakes and two poles broke free from the tie-downs, crashing right through the cab of the truck. The poles are made of metal and concrete and owned by Duke Energy. Each one weighs almost 5,500 pounds. All lanes are back open and the driver wasn't injured. A young South Florida couple feared for their lives when someone shot at them. It happened after they ended up at the wrong Broward County address while delivering groceries for Instacart. Nico Clemens reports. I had seen him pull out a gun and I said, that's why I was like, we gotta go, we gotta go. It was a routine delivery, but this one was different. I was scared, I'm not gonna lie. It turned dangerous. Waldis Thomas says he was delivering groceries for Instacart Saturday. His girlfriend, Diamond Darville, was with them. They say they were on the phone with the customer trying to find her address, but ended up at another home on Southwest 178th Avenue in Southwest Ranches. As they were about to drive off the property, they say they saw a flashlight. It's like going, he's like, um, who are you, who are you, da, 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 and we're saying like, we're with Instacart, we're with Instacart. Darville says they thought this was the person they were supposed to deliver to. But things took a terrible turn. He gets in his truck and reverses like our car is here and he like put, pulls up right here. She says they tried to get away and that's when she saw a man pull out a gun and start shooting. Here, um, right yeah. here. Darville says her car was hit several times. Thomas says they pulled over about a block away. Soon they were talking with Davy police. Instead of just calling the police and have chest pressers on my own, he decided to shoot. Police confirmed with NBC6 only that a gun went off at a home on Southwest 178th Avenue, and they cannot release specific information at the moment. Darville says this is what a detective told them. He asked if he wanted to prosecute, and we had agreed to do that, but he said since they didn't necessarily break any laws, they didn't do anything unlawful, that they couldn't really do anything because we're on their property. Well, residents in West Oklahoma are still picking up the bits and pieces left behind by tornadoes earlier this week. We'll show you just how much damage damage this community is facing. Plus, other states dealt with their share of severe weather overnight. What's next for those areas coming up after the break? Welcome back. Cleanup continues in central Oklahoma communities from Wednesday's tornadoes. Overnight, Texas, Arkansas, and Illinois all dealt with severe weather as well. NBC's Katie Beck is in Cole, Oklahoma with the latest. In Cole, Oklahoma, recovery and cleanup efforts are underway after that EF3 tornado ripped through the town, claiming three lives and leveling so many homes and businesses. People here are just now starting to put the pieces together, but as that recovery is underway, more severe spring weather overnight. A tornado touching down in Tyler, Texas, damaging rains, causing flash flooding in Austin, stalled vehicles and water rescues. We also saw damaging rain in Arkansas and golf ball size hail in Illinois. That weather affecting tens of millions of people. Meanwhile, back in Cole, some good news on the horizon as they are out of the way of severe weather and cleanup efforts can continue. They tell us the top priority is returning power to folks here. Thousands remain without it and finding permanent housing for those that no longer have a home to return to. In Cole, Oklahoma, I'm Katie Beck for NBC News. Still tracking this uh, storm up in the uh, peninsula of Florida and by tomorrow it might be pushing into our area, but not until the afternoon. Generally some pretty good weather tonight. As you look at our campus cam up, uh, up above uh, Ben Hogarvin Stadium, beautiful blue skies right now, some clouds, not too much rain sitting in the mid 80s. As we look through the, west, the rest of the state, on the west side, a lot of it is in the mid 80s to upper 80s, but as we look to the east side, some of it is dipping into the 70s. 
for this evening. Again, starting off in the 80s, but pushing down into the uh, 70s and 60s, a little bit at night, a little bit of showers potentially. And if you get a little bit cold at night, maybe put on your heater. I know I won't be, but if you get cold, maybe you should. As you push to tomorrow, it is Earth Day and there could be some showers up along the I-10 corridor. That's where the showers would be. Generally in the morning, pretty low 60s for most of the temperatures in the in the area on the east side of the state, maybe up a little bit more into the upper 60s. As you look in the vis visibility in the morning, there could be some dense fog in our area, but it should really clear up by 8 a.m. Just in time for you to get out out there, get some Earth Day activities, maybe clean up your backyard, clean up the neighborhood. Generally, just go love the Earth. As, again, tomorrow is Earth Day. A little bit of a chance of rain dipping into the 70s in the evening, but if your Saturday does get rained out, Sunday is National Picnic Day. Beautiful day all the way across. Get out there with a the picnic, have some bread, have some fruit, and generally enjoy the day. Again, as we look for some uh, for some for some rain, a cold front, cold front coming through, some rain up in the I-10 area, a little bit here in Gainesville as we look to Sunday. Great in the morning, but again, a little bit of showers here. Not too much though, should be pretty nice. As we look to our six day outlook, again, Earth Day tomorrow in the mid 80s, same thing with National Picnic Day. As we look to the rest of the week in the middle, there could be some chances for rain and highs in the low 80s. Back to you. Thanks, Jensen. Well, tomorrow is senior day for Gator Lacrosse, and there's also a lot of seniors being recognized today on the show. And the two of you happen to be my favorite. <laughs> Aww, Sarah. thank you, Sarah. I'm really going to miss you guys, but it's also exciting to people, see people move on to more exciting things, like quarterback Anthony Richardson, as the NFL draft is a week away. I'll tell you what analysts have to say about where Richardson matches up with Kentucky quarterback Will Levis. That's coming up after the break. You're watching WUFT TV News. Welcome to your Friday Sports. I'm Julia Rickenbaugh. Tonight, number three Gator Baseball looks to even up its series versus number six South Carolina. The two teams started out trading runs back and forth in Columbia. Gator Colby Halter tied up the game at 3 3 with an RBI triple in the sixth. But after starter Brandon Sprout left the game in the bottom of the inning, Philip Abner walked three straight batters. Nick Figueroa came in and immediately walked two more. The Gamecocks scored 10 runs in the 6th and the 7th, and Mercy ruled the Gators 13-3. Florida will have to win tonight if it wants a chance to win the series, and they'll have to do it without closer Brandon Neely, who is serving his four-game suspension after being ejected. Right-handed pitcher Hurston Waldrop will get the start. First pitch is set for 7 p.m. Meanwhile, number 14 Florida softball faces a top-10 opponent of its own. Tomorrow, the Gators play number four, Tennessee, on the road. After catcher Emily Wilkie's walk-off grand slam Wednesday to beat USF, Florida moved to 32-11 on the season. The Gators currently stand sixth in the Southeastern Conference, but they're only two games behind the team in second, Georgia. Reigning SEC Player of the Week, Skylar Wallace, has been helping close that gap. Wallace has reached base in 15 of her last 17 plate appearances and has scored nine runs in the last five games. Tomorrow is a big opportunity against conference leader Tennessee starting at 4 p.m. Also tomorrow, number nine Florida lacrosse hosts Vanderbilt. And like we said, it's that time of the year. It's senior day. The Gators will host Vanderbilt and honor, sorry, honor 17 seniors, about half of their 44 player roster. All these seniors will have their ceremony after the game. The game versus Vanderbilt starts at noon at Disney Stadium. The SEC Tennis Championships began Wednesday and continue through Sunday for both men's and women's. We'll go ladies first, though. The four-seeded women's tennis squad took down 12-seed Ole Miss 4-0 in the quarterfinals. They'll now face Texas A&M tomorrow in the semifinals. First serve is set for one. Meanwhile, the UF men are taking on one-seed Georgia in the quarterfinals. They got here by beating nine-seed Auburn 4-1 yesterday. Florida narrowly lost 4-3 to the Bulldogs back on April 9th. Right now, the Bulldogs are up 1-0. And the SEC championships just keep on coming. After day three of competition today, Florida men's golf advances to the quarterfinals tomorrow. They'll play number six, Ole Miss. With the NFL draft less than a week away, lots of SEC players are looking to be selected in the first round. 
CBS NFL analyst Charles Davis joined WRF Sports Scene to discuss where he thinks these players will end up. He thinks Bryce Young is the first pick. But he's also been impressed with Gator quarterback Anthony Richardson's touch on the ball. Here's what Davis has to say about Richardson's competition from the Kentucky Wildcats. Will Levis has spent a lot of time in the weight room up in Kentucky, and he looks terrific. He's a distant second to Anthony Richardson. ESPN NFL draft expert Jordan Reed said Richardson could be ready to start in his first year if he gets the right coach. These SEC players will find out where they fall next Thursday. Thanks, Juliana. Get ready for some cuteness. A Springboro, Ohio elementary school had special visitors take a tour of the building this week. A family of ducks. The mother duck is no stranger to the school. For the past five years, she has made Clear Creek Elementary School's sensory garden her home. She uses the outdoor garden space to build nests and lay her eggs. The school's occupational therapist says the sensory garden is free of predators and she believes the soothing sound of the wind chimes keeps their babies calm at night. This year, the school relocated the mother duck and her 12 ducklings to a wooded space behind the school to give them a less confined space. And before we go, one last check on the weather. Thanks, Sarah. Tomorrow is Earth Day, so make sure you get out there and go help out the Earth. Some pretty nice weather early in the morning, but could be a little bit muggy and in the 80s in the afternoon. As we look at our six-day outlook, oh, sorry, Earth Day tomorrow, like I said, mid-80s. Sunday is National Picnic Day, so get out there. It's a beautiful day. And as we look through to the wet rest of the week, highs are in the low 80s with some chances for some showers in the midweek. Back to you. Thanks, Jensen. And before we go, I would like to take a moment to thank you, the viewers, for welcoming me into your homes for the past year and a half. This is the final time you'll see me at the desk here on First at Five as I'm graduating in two weeks from UF. It's been an honor to tell your stories, and working with everyone here at WUFT News was an experience I will never forget. Gainesville and WUFT News will always have a special place in my heart. Oh, Ophelia, I'm just so excited to watch you grow. And let's just take a quick trip down memory lane to when we met in high school at journalism camp right here at UF five years ago. That we were is so young. adorable. <laughs> Look how young we were. As always, BBC World News is up next, and the PBS NewsHour is coming up at 7. And as always, your Florida news is always on at WUFT.org. Have a great night.